gardens and they've always been on the main road so people have driven by and comment and they think they know me and they tell me I'm out there all the time which I'm not I'm just there when they go by you know so um, but one of the more famous ones um, was in Moortown Village which is in the gorge which is um, eight miles from here and it was a very unique spot or it is a unique spot this red house I think was a mill workers manager's oh, I know place. What you're talking about. And we owned, my husband and I owned this long strip. It was a very narrow strip between the road and the river. <laughs> there was a tiny piece of land, but it was very long. And I terraced and gardened every, every inch of it. And I planted 75 roses, different classifications. And people told me all my life, you can't grow roses in Vermont. They also said, you can't grow anything next to the road because the salt is going to kill everything. Um, and all the sand that the dump trucks, you know, they pile over in the winter, that's, that's the topsoil. So I just have never listened to all this talk, you know, you can't do this, you can't do that. Especially if it's so inexpensive and, and exciting to sort of prove people wrong. And you're not, it's not criminal, um, it doesn't cost a lot, I mean, unless you get into a really rare place, which I did for a while, and, and then a flood came in 98 and washed all my expensive plants away, so I don't do that anymore. But I'm going to pass around these pictures, and the red house here, you can see, um, and the road is right here on the right margin. Um, and then down here is what it looks like in spring before, if you look at the other pictures, before everything grows up. There's just the guardrail and a lot of sand. And before it gets to this point, there's this kind of gray crust on it. <laughs> Nothing living on it. It looks like after, you know whatever, Armageddon or something. But now, you know, it, it's amazing how this just comes to life. Even wherever you are, you can take a piece, you can take between that yellow post over there and that little tree, you could, you could grow the most amazing plants that are on this earth if you just know a few simple things. So that's what we're, today's simple things are gonna have to do with the weather. And because we are living in um, uh, days of, of climate change, of maybe probably more than we used to encounter 50 years ago. I can say that as a witness, but uh, but before that, I don't really know, <laughs> maybe 60 anyway. So um, here are the pictures. Um, just a lot of the terraces I did. You can you can get a sense, all of this is, is area that's in this long strip between the guardrails and the water and the stones, okay? So um, there's not really any order, but I, I just thought I'd pass them around if you wanna look. Um, Okay, the first thing I want to talk about is the obvious weather patterns that we're dealing with right now. All this rain. Now, people are walking around talking like it's never happened before. I just think, you know, it's happened like this 19 years out of 20 in the past 20 years. I keep a, I keep a record in here because I get so excited when there's a spring where, you know, it's 70, 80 degrees for six weeks. The last time that happened was in 1995. <laughs> Because we bought our, we bought this place, and that's why I remember it. You know, you connect growing all these things with the weather patterns. You have you, you have to you have to get that immersed in it, and it's fun. Um, so the last time we had another six week warm spell or even more was last year. So since 1995 and last year, we have not had. I'm sorry to say this if you're newcomers or, you know, maybe this lady from California didn't want to hear this. Um, <laughs> but what we can do is we can make the most of it. We have a perfect 90 days here in Vermont of, of, of growing, even if it's rainy and, and awful for us, you know, in terms of sports and, and cookouts and whatever. Um, we can gear our gardening around that. Okay, so one of your best friends, that's why I was talking about this, um, is... Weather.com has um, a 10, it's almost two weeks, printable um, forecast. I'll show it to you. Mimi, these pictures are beautiful. Oh my Thanks. God, and I know what you're yeah, talking about. Yeah, I'm a specialist about. in roses. And uh, the thing is, like like you say, all the you can't, you can't, you can't, you sure did prove them wrong. I did. Those poppies are growing on pavement. <laughs> I love doing that too, you know. <laughs> One season, you know, just threw them in the ground. And, you know, there's just a few little things that you know need to know how to do, and you can do that. Um, this spring actually would have been a perfect spring and is for poppies, but we, we needed to have planted them a month ago. 
um, because it's now it's too warm. Because what we've had the past couple of months is, is really kind of like winter in California, which is where all these poppies are indigenous oh, to. Right. And that's another thing you can get excited about. You need to write that down. <laughs> knowing where things are from, you know, mm. in the world. Where did they originate? One that tells you a lot about their needs, you know, light, heat, but specifically the pH. Um, I talk a lot about pH because it's key, it's everything. And especially in a year like this, where we are having extremes, you know, from the get-go. Sometimes we'll just have it in the middle or at the end or at the beginning, but it, to me, I think if this is going to break this pattern we've had of all the rain, uh, it, it's going to break. To me, it's not going to happen until July, like early July. There's something about the change of seasons and solstice. I don't know. You know, I don't. I haven't studied it a lot, but I won't be surprised if that's what happens. So, as gardeners, we have to get we have to get ready for that. We can't sort of delude ourselves into thinking and planting a lot of things that are not going to succeed if we keep having uh, this kind of weather. Okay. So, weather.com has a a feature you can find. It's 10 day. 10 day, it's, you can hit up here, you can enter in your town. Um, 10 day printable forecast, you hit the print, um, and you can print it out if you want to. But the printable forecast gives you everything at a glance, it's what's gonna happen in the past, uh, in, the, in the next two weeks. What I can see right away here, um, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, it's gonna be in the lower 60s. Like 60, if we're lucky, is what it says here, with 50% chance of um, precipitation on two out of three days. Okay, does that say anything to you, Jack? It says my soil is going to stay wet and cold and cool. Cool. Okay, so you're going to run out and Things plant your squash germinate. or beans? No, you're right. Things, things that are 70 degree germinators won't germinate. But the world is the plant world is sort of divided up into two groups: 40 degree day, you know, 40 degree germinators, and 70 degree germinators. So it's a perfect time to keep pushing those 40 degree germinators because uh, it's cool and wet. It's a perfect time to plant bushes and shrubs. A perfect year to do that. If you put that off and you think, oh no, I'll wait till next year. We could have a drought next year. So you know, if you have a, a home place and, and you want to add thinks this is the perfect year to do it, okay? Um, or at least right now, because you don't have to water every day. I, I put in five roses, <laughs> uh, because they're getting watered all the time. And um, So make this, this pattern work for you, okay? These three cool days, no, I wouldn't plant green beans, anything that says wait till warm after frost, that sort of thing on your packets or whatever, squashes, uh, tomatoes, peppers, eggplants, you can wait and, and wait until next weekend. Or it's, 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 it's uh, changing like on Thursday up to the 70s. And then it, we're gonna get one sunny day and it's gonna be cloudy for four. Perfect germinating weather. It's gonna be in the mid 70s. So if anybody tells you you better plant everything this weekend, say no, I'm waiting till next week when it's warmer, okay? So it's these kinds of things you can you can steer around the weather patterns, um, you know. If there are things that you know that love a lot of moisture, like I said, this is another year to to go for them. Um, things that love drought, dry sort of deserty plants, I wouldn't bother. <laughs> I would, uh, I would just forsake those because it's not going to happen here. You know, we're, you're not going to get the weather that you need. And I would just stay away from sort of gimmicky kind of, a lot of people get, you know, well, I used to do this, you know, planting peaches or kiwis or, you know, things that are sort of marginal that you might get, like watermelons. Sure, you get the watermelon, but you'll get it in mid-September or late September. And when people don't want watermelons, they want apples. So... You know, watermelons might be something not to grow here, you know, because they mature so late. And uh, and then when you get them, if you get a cold or cool evening, it zaps the flavor right out of them. So, so yes, you probably can grow them here, but, you know, if you want more success than that, than to say, oh, I grew a watermelon or I grew a kiwi or a peach, and it's inedible, but I grew it, you know, stay away from that. You know, go for the tried and true. 
Um, another way is to, um, to, to sort of protect yourself against these um, weather extremes is to um, look for varieties of seeds that are, are geared for the north. Um, uh, I know high mowing seeds has really captured the market up here. They, you never used to see a local seed company and now that's all you can find everywhere almost. But they're sort of tried and true up here and they come back, they reproduce themselves and you can save the seeds. Okay, what would be one drawback from saving seeds? Anybody? <laughs> Like, like um, harvesting the seed from my plant and just yes. planting it. Yes. Uh, well, you, you're not going to get as, as good a quality necessarily as, as the company, so a lower Could germination be. rate. Could be. Mm -hmm. Certain plants don't produce, reproduce the same quality seed. You know. Okay. I'm leaving you here. I mean, <laughs> there's one thing that's going to really be uh, wreak havoc in gardens. In, with all this rain now, and that is disease, both subterraneously and above the ground. Uh -huh. Underground, there are a lot of fungal things. If you want to grow pot outside this year, do not put it in the ground <laughs> um, because the funguses will infect it so, so much so that it won't show until later in the season. If you've noticed tomato plants, you know, everybody's tomato loses, they, they all turn brown and fall off at the end of the in September. They're not supposed to be that like that, that is not supposed to happen. Um, that is a disease that's underground. It's already there. It's always there. And in seasons like this, when we get this rain constantly, it just flourishes and takes over. So you will be seeing a lot more disease, but there are things you can do. So we're moving into sort of shifting from the weather to disease here. Um, one, pH. pH is everything. Um, I know one of the students I had in the last group that I gave, she went and had her, her, her raised, she made raised beds and she had it tested because everything that she'd put in there, she bought, you know, came out of bags and she had no clue what the pH was. And it was actually a lot higher than I thought it would be, it was like 7.4, but it's because there was a lot of compost in there. And that's <coughs> perfect. Um, Vermont soils are, are, uh, are acidic. In some places, very acidic, severely acidic. Um, it, the pH has been, on average, has been dropping, dropping, dropping. That's why we see so much knotweed along the rivers and, um, and, and that bishop's weed, they've both taken over because they prefer pH from like four to seven. And that, in, in those conditions, they just take right over. Whereas um, Vermont, the, the indigenous plants have, have been replaced by these because the pH has gotten too low for them. And, and it's a lot has to do with the acid rain. The rain that comes from all the industrialization in the Midwest of the country that comes east and dumps in Vermont is usually very acidic. So the combination of those two things, um, plus we're, we're east of the Continental D Divide. The Continental Divide divides the country uh, and the soils into two different groups, acidic or alkaline pH. So, um, except for there's pockets. Like here in Vermont, uh, you know, the, around the lake, it's, it's alkaline because of all the limestone. Um, I think that's kind of cool. Um, so making sure your pH is up there. If you know you, know, you haven't limed and your ground is, is just regular Vermont soil, you cannot go wrong by lining. That's one of the things that I've always been told, you know, oh, you'll, you'll over lime and you'll kill your plants. That has never happened to me, and I have never seen a garden that, for which that is true. I have seen a lot, most gardens that are really poor and not living up to their potential, not doing what their planters had hoped because they didn't bother to raise the pH, they didn't bother to lime. Not only does the, the um, lime contribute <coughs> um, well, uh, the ions, it's a hydrogen ion relation, ratio that um, it enters in with the molecules in the soil and calcium, you know, human beings are needing calcium, so does the soil and so do the things that you grow in it. Um, if your pH is fine, you know, if you're up there around neutral like this student I had was, um, what you would do if you found that you didn't have enough calcium, if you get a soil test, or if you just suspect that you don't, and you want to add calcium, um, gypsum, 
which there are, I think there are uh, mines right here in Vermont, which is kind of cool. You know, everything we need is right here. You got the limestone from the Shelburne limestone, or <coughs> the gypsum, because um, gypsum does not raise the pH. It doesn't play with the pH. It just contributes the calcium. Um, like there are a lot of plants that um, are lime haters, you know, uh, and, and like blueberries, um, azaleas, um, rhododendrons, Japanese irises. Those are the main ones that people tend to grow around here that you would never ever lime or you, you want fir trees, you know, evergreens. You keep all those things separate in their own separate garden, but the rest of the places, especially if you like Mediterranean plants, which I do, I like a lot of, you know, the herbs. Um, they'll kind of grow anywhere, um, but if you give them what they come from, like sort of rocky, poor soil that heats up fast and has a high pH, they will do things like you will never, you know, like you sort of expected but never got, especially with the flavor. The flavor, the, the fragrance, everything will be a lot stronger, um, and the plants will be healthier, and they'll withstand the weather pattern changes. Um, Potash, you know, you have the NPK on a bag of fertilizer, you know, uh, nitrogen, phosphorus, um, potash. Those are the three, you know, it's kind of like in Wonder Bread, you know, how they, they bleached out everything and isolated three key nutrients that you might need and then put them back in. Well, that's kind of like, you know, the fer fertilizer formula, NPKs on a bag of fertilizer is that sort of simplistic, um, this is all that's really necessary approach. But um, a better approach is to think about your soil as a living, a living thing, a living fill in the blank. Um, soil wants to be alive. It wants to have, you know, activity going on there that resembles life. That's what the worms start. And, and to get the worms, you gotta have air and you've got to have organic matter and you've got to have all these things um, for them to move about and their castings and, and, and if, you, if you don't compact it all and drive heavy, huge, heavy equipment over everything, you create this, this medium uh, that can be as deep as you want. I like to go like a couple of feet, um, especially um, if, if you like to do um, biodynamics, um, double digging, um, root compaction is a terrible thing for plants. This is a, one more thing that you can do to minimize the stress of climate change is to give them as much freedom to move. Don't ever walk on your growing spaces. Just don't. Don't put any heavy machinery. I always do mine by hand. I do huge territories by hand. If you don't want to, you can use a tiller, but don't walk on the growing spaces. Leave them to be loose and free, minimal compaction. You don't even have to till them. You don't have to turn them over. You can sort of loosen them up, add more organic matter, add your rock powders like lime, which I've talked about. Okay, another one that is very um, influential uh, against disease is the K, the third number, um, which is potash. One of my favorite um, amendments is um, um, granite dust. I read about it in Rodale uh, 50 years ago and never thought I could find it, but I did. I mean, it's very easy to find around here. Anyway, um, it's a place that I've gone for a long time. is a, a, um, a sculptor's quarry, in, I mean, a sculptor's place in Barrie, Vermont Sculptor's Studio. They have a, a huge hopper outside and there's a big pile and they, they love to have people come and take it. And they take buckets full, you fill up the truck buckets. It's heavy, but it's potash, and it's very important for the health, especially underground, uh, uh, the roots, um, and, and the disease resistance that your plants need. Another source that's commonly available are, are uh, the root, um, wood ashes. Wood ashes from your stove. Um, and if you're, my husband told me to do this a long time ago, <laughs> 25 years ago, and I thought he was a cannibal. But I put my meat scraps in the wood stove. Um, you, you have a hot fire. It's just like being out at the campfire. You got a really hot fire. If you had some chicken or whatever, you know, fish, throw them in the throw them in the wood stove. They they burn to a white ash, and you can powder it. I, I, I've always pummeled it and, and broadcasted it. It's a secret to my perfect tomatoes. I have better tomatoes than anybody you know, and. Um, 
it's not cannibalistic. I read about it in Rodale, but the phosphorus content is, is off the charts. It's like higher than super phos phosphate, which was triple phosphate, which is what farmers used to use you know, 50 years ago. And it was horrible because it, it killed all the life in your soil. Um, that combination of compaction and all these you know, intense chemical fertilizers is what disrupted um, and, and um, ruined for some farmers you know, their, their, their livelihood because they didn't manage their soils properly. properly. Um, I was married to a dairy farm for 12 years. So that's my, my reference. <laughs> but um, potash, wood ashes, cook your, if you have a wood stove, cook all those bones, powder them, put them on your plants. I always guard it because it's, you know, it's kind of concentrated and I don't broadcast it because uh, I need it. I use it for specific areas. Rock powders, all these amendments. They give you superior health to your plants, above ground and below ground. Um, okay, um, back to planting. You know, it's the 1st of June. Um, it's sort of the traditional, you know, May 31st is the traditional Memorial Day. And as growing up, I've seen snow as recently as 20 years ago on May 31st. Um, 30, 40, 50 years ago, we would commonly get frosts up until that day, up until that very day. <laughs> it wasn't, you know, invented, you know, out of nowhere. It was sort of, this happens often, therefore wait. Um, it's always generally better to wait in a year like this for things that are 70 degree germinators. If we still got three days of 60 degrees and rain coming, you know, wait. Um, okay, talked about the, the rock powder amendments, um, keeping your pH high. Um, don't plant too closely, you know. This is more for um, vegetable gardens or even perennial gardens. Thin them out. Um, light's gonna be at a premium. Um, close packed plants, leaves together, um, encourages mold and disease if they're wet all the time. They, don't, they can't dry out. Um, so if they're, if they're further apart, um, and you, you just automatically include more space than you know is required on your instructions, I think in a year like this, you'll be better off. Much better off, less disease. Um, disease is gonna be the, the real clincher. Um, okay, so another thing you can do, let me see, I think I've covered, you know, planting things later and further apart. Um, and the amendments. Um, let's see. You can also um, you can also implement uh, what they call it is an IPD a, a spray program. Now spray has become this horrible word. You talk to an organic person, or they say, "Oh yeah, I never use you know I never use chemical sprays. I never that's I I garden organically. I never use any sprays." Well, first of all, everybody if you ask them if they garden organically, they automatically sort of talk about all the things that they don't do. You know, you never hear somebody say. I really rely heavily on, on, on amendments, on rock powders, on compost, um, on um, keeping the soil free, tilth-wise, you know, not compacting. No, it's always, I don't use this and I don't use that. A lot of people approach gardening that way. I don't do this, I don't do that. But they don't replace those don'ts with do's. <laughs> they don't say, I do do this and I do do that. And that's kind of something I've been kind of trying to point out to people that more importantly is what you do do, not what you don't do. So um, I have, um, over the years, um, come to rely on two products, or two, one's just an element, it's not a, you know, a product that I get from any one company, but Elemental Copper is um, a real um, saver, and um, it's a uh, encouraged or sold by Johnny's. Johnny's Seeds, you know, I, I use them. You can get the information for like 10 gardening books in their catalog. It's amazing. And they're from Maine. Um, and uh, the first one was just a little two, three pages stapled over in <laughs> 1973. And um, now it's a huge catalog, like a Sears catalog. And, but the information is there. And they really get into pH. They give you the exact, because they know, you know, they're pros. 
Um, pH is just as important to them as it's, I've found it to be. Um, copper, they use copper. It's, um, for some reason, uh, it uh, really does uh, deter fungal growth on things. You can also use it as a, um, what do you call it? a drench in the ground. Before you plant your tomatoes, drench the whole area with copper, elemental copper. Soak the soil, because that will kill all the fungus that's there now. Because that those plants are getting infected now, as soon as you put them in there. It's not going to show for three months. So that includes your pot, that includes your tomatoes, your squashes, uh, cucumbers, um, all kinds of plants that are susceptible, susceptible to these uh, diseases, especially blights that hit later on. Okay, so I'll tell you, there's another product um, that I use, and it's called neem. <clears throat> it's, it's a tree oil from India. I, I've heard various discussions, you know, sort of pros and cons about using it because people are exploiting the, the trees and exploiting the people who farm and whatever, but I think it's still, it's, it's, it's a super, super um, broad spectrum fungicide and insecticide. Um, and it's as natural as we're going to get, you know. I don't know that it's been used extensively enough and long enough for, for people to determine whether it, it causes disease, I mean, in humans or not, like rotenone. I used to use rotenone, that was safe, now, now they've decided that it causes uh, MS or uh, I don't know, other neurological diseases, uh, or autoimmune diseases is what I meant. Um, I don't know, I'm willing to take the risk. I, I use it seldom, you know, I, I don't overuse it. Um, I'm careful, you know, I don't lick my fingers after I touch it, you know, wear a mask or whatever. It, it, I haven't found it to be a problem, but I would, I would what I do is alter. And in, if we continue to have this kind of a, um, you know, rain every two, three, four days, you're gonna to have to spray something every two, three, four days on these plants that are really disease uh, prone. And if you do that, you, you won't have the diseases that everybody else has. I can't promise you that you won't have any, but I think I can promise you that you'll have far less. Um, I've seen, what it does is it buys you time at the other end of the season too, and it also protects your tomatoes um, from, well, from the underground fungal diseases, and then these other two products, when you all alternate them, they protect you against early and late blight. And they'll hit like you would not believe. I've heard it had an early blight come just one day in June, it just came with the wind. I swear, I was standing there watching it. It's like, it no. came out of the Northwest, and it was whoosh, and then all of a sudden, and it was a path, right straight diagonally through my garden. And I could see all the tomatoes that were in that path. They all had this blight, and it just kind of went, it just came and went. So that's an early blight. That's the habit that, it, and then all of a sudden, you, know, you can't eat them. They're destroyed. So you have to protect against that, because you never know when that's going to hit. And then the late blight, um, same thing. You can get disease uh, variety uh, plants. You know, there's some that are claiming to be more disease resistant uh, than others. That's another thing to look for as you shop for uh, seeds and plants, um, disease resistance, um, they'll, like Johnny's, they have a whole list of all the disease, you know, resistant properties of the tomatoes that they smell, sell. <laughs> and, and you can go through and say, oh, late blight, um, I need that. You know, I had horrible late blight. Um, late blight would just render your whole crop inedible in like seconds. I've, I've had that happen in 1998. When I was living in this place on the gorge, it rained every single day of the month of June. Every single day. There was one afternoon it did not rain, and I took pictures of the, the roses in town, the, the ones that were there, the antiques, antiques that had been left from people. Because that's why, that's why and how I remember all these things. You know, I associate things that I've done or you know, what I saw and try and keep a memory of um, what happened. But... It rained every day, and, and when my, my tomatoes were perfect, they looked amazing. You know, they were like six, seven feet tall. They were huge like this, and they were hanging. Like you couldn't even see any leaves. There were so many tomatoes, and all of a sudden, one day, they all had this, like, leprosy all over them, top to bottom, every single one of them. You could not eat them. You can't even look at them. And it just happened just like that, you know, and um, that's late flight. So 
name and um, uh, <laughs> elemental copper, thank you. <laughs> so uh, those are some real good tools. I, I think it's gonna stay like this, I really do. Uh, if it doesn't, if it, if it, if it changes, <clears throat> Those, those diseases are still going to be there, and they're still gaining hold, you know, on your plants from now on. So, you know, if, if the weather cooperates and lessens the threat of diseases later on, good. But for now, we need to protect them as much as we can, you know, until that happens. That could happen, because I know 100-year-old people, I have a lot of friends who, unfortunately, they die, but who are like 100 and have said they've never seen a year that things didn't even out. So, you know, no matter if we get all this horrible stuff, um, it evens out. <laughs> so, I've been talking a lot, and I just want to know if I've raised any questions uh, for either of you that, you know, I could touch on before we go on. Thank you. You should have said it sounds like it's not too late to put bees in. <laughs> This is going to right. Okay, so, okay, no, interesting. You're right. You're right. It's a great idea. It's, oh, sweet peas. I love sweet peas. Um, it's not a bad idea. Um, you know, what have you got to lose? You know, a pack of seeds or two? Uh, definitely. Especially if you, if you have cool, a cool spot, you know, that uh, is sort of wetter than normal. Yeah. Very good. You're getting it. <laughs> I, I tried to till yesterday, and and uh, I just it didn't feel like I was accomplishing anything. No. In fact, it felt like I was probably doing more damage. You're a smart man. And I just okay. Then what do I do? <laughs> I want to put my garden in. It's gotta wait. Yeah. Unless you um but, I mean, can you use we, a shovel are you like do you have back injuries or i can um, but i don't wanna <laughs> um you can make mounds you know you can uh -huh. raise raise beds um raise everything up as much as you can above that wet place and yeah. later on in the season that could really work for you but now it's yeah it's not working for you it's working against you so yeah. you might have to do a lot more by hand it's funny i I live um, on Winooski Street, and I have a little art gallery. I'm a painter, and I um, wanted to have a tiny little garden there, and and I put in um, <coughs> some roses, and uh, I forgot what I was going to say. Sorry. Let's <laughs> be the camera. Um, um, as soon as I double dug the whole area, which I do. Um, Keep that ground loose. Don't step on it. You know all that compaction. What it does is interferes with the water being able to trickle, you know, yeah. percolate the way it needs yeah. to. Either it runs off, and then the roots have to grow sideways, and they're always sitting in the water. You don't want that. Don't ever walk on your. All of a sudden, a new tenant moved in next door, and the tenant wanted to have the space that I had just double dug with my shovel. Oh, it's you know like twice the size of the table here, and. I don't like to share, but I did, because she wants to learn. But what got me is she told me she just got a degree in sustainability from UVM, and she wanted to know where the tiller was. And I said, you, you don't use a tiller with a degree in sustainability? Come on. <laughs> in a space that's 10 by 3, you know, you use your shovel. You know, she's young and healthy, I think. I don't think she had any back issues. So I think she sort of got the... Got the gist of it, but we, we, we did it and I made you know mounds and raised things up. So um, that's something you could do. It seems like raised beds are in our future. We mean our future. Well, I mean they're not in your past. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, right? I I last year I was struggling with you know do I do I put raised beds in or not? I was thinking I wanted to and then. Yeah, but and anyway, today I wish I'd done it that way. Okay, why did you want to last year? Um, well, I'm trying to get a community garden going, and I, um. it's just seems like the people in general seem to feel who are starting out feel more comfortable with raised beds. It's sort of like the mark of uh, 
community garden. You, you know it's a community garden because of the whole. The raised beds? <laughs> the raised beds are all lined up. I don't know what the pluses and minuses well, you know, are. What do you think? See, I don't think most people do either. They're just doing it because they see other people doing it and they know yeah. it's sort of being talked about. And it's the same thing with that red bark mulch. You know, I, well, anyway, don't get me going on that. <laughs> Anything that color, you know, can't be that great. You know, it's like all those dyes. I'm horribly uh, affected by dyes. If I touch dyes, I go to my kidneys and I get the killer back pains. Um, I hate that stuff and it smells really bad. Um, but everybody uses it because everybody uses it, you know. Uh -huh. um, raised beds are, are good for what you just described. If you have a wet surface and it's not drying out, um, what you need to do is raise everything above that surface. And everything above will, will drop down, you know, will, will trickle down to that level. So you've just given yourself, your roots, another foot to grow in if, if you do a raised bed yeah. that's, that's moist but not sopping wet um, or, or compacted. Yeah. Um, plus a lot of people like um, the fact that it's a little higher, you don't have to bend down as far You know, if you have back problems. <laughs> sure. No, make it easy, don't make it hard. Yeah. Hello. Are you the lady from California? Hi. Have a seat. <laughs> I'm Mimi. Mimi and Andy. Andy. And Jack. And Jack. Hi. I'm Tanya. I'm Tanya Hi. and Jerome. <laughs> so we've we've uh, we've covered a lot. Uh, maybe uh, Andy and Jack could just uh, recapture some of the things I've just brought up and help fill in Tanya. I had raised bed, so you talked about water table. Yeah, I was just whining about oh. it. But one of the, the, the takeaways for me today was, was um, the idea of uh, watching the 10-day weather forecasts and, and really trying to make decisions on the basis of what we know about is going to happen as opposed to my for instance, just wishful thinking. I, mean, I want my <laughs> soil to be dry, and it isn't, and so I get impatient and go out and till it anyway, but if I'd looked at the weather report, it would have told me that it's gonna rain for another week anyway, so don't do that. Um, but but in, in, the, in the name of trying to be more conscious of the fact that, that our weather patterns are changing, how, what can I do to make choices that that uh, reflect the reality of the weather as opposed to it's May 31st, so it must be time for me to put all the plants on the ground. Right. Um, and uh, so that was one of my takeaways. Take Very away. good. That's excellent. Um, it's on weather.com. They have a 10-day printable forecast that I, I love. It's, it's on my homepage. Um, and because it gives you at a glance, you know, what's going to be happening. You know, 50 years ago, this didn't exist. And I'd have to guess. And there'd be a, what, what, what would in, most often happen with the last 10 days of May, that you'd get 70, 80 degrees for 10 days. The neighbor called it a Bermuda high. <laughs> <laughs> he was another dairy farmer. And he wouldn't hay until a Bermuda high was coming. But we had no idea when it was coming. Whereas now, um, and I was telling you about, you know, the temperature drop. They've already dropped it lower than, than what was forecast. So we're going to get, it, this is the pattern. This would be a fun exercise if you guys like studying weather patterns, <laughs> if you really like it. Um, go to an archive. I think, I don't know, I've never checked out the archive on weather.com, but you can go to the Burlington Airport and maybe check their archives. Look at the weather patterns for the past six months. You'll see there's a 10, there's, all winter long, people just said, oh, it was cold, it was miserable. What we actually went through was this repeat, you know, it was this constant repeat of like a five-day thing where uh, it, it would freeze, you know, it would snow one day, dump snow, then it would rain the next day, then it would freeze to ice, be brutally cold, and then it would start all over again, and it would just sort of repeat over, you know. We've got that same kind of thing going. It would have that dip, which was what caused the, caused the, you know, the freezing. We'd have that brutal dip in the temperature, the cold. 
that is still happening in the 10 day forecast. We're getting all this moisture and then we're getting that dip, you know, uh, two, three days where it's really cold and then we're going back up to, you know, another 15, 20 degrees. I don't think we've seen the end of that. I think we're gonna see that, you know, until maybe like July, for some reason I've noticed like around July 10th, that's when all the poppies bloom. You know, there's something, this is another thing you'll notice about plants is that some of them are, are, are um, keyed into responding to temperatures. You know, when it's warm enough, they'll come up in spring. Others, it's the length of day triggers them. They'll only come up when, you know, the length of day. Poppies always bloom on July 10th. You know, it's like you can set your watch by it, or at least where I was in the gorge. Um, the days were shorter there, the sunlight days were shorter than where I was uh, the other end of Moore Town, and they bloomed a week earlier. But um, <clears throat> pay attention. This is that was a really great uh, thing to take away. If that's all you take away, you'll be you'll be grateful. Seriously. Um, yes, because after these three cold days, we've got. 10 days of 75, you know, 70 to 75, partly cloudy showers, but only one sunny day. So don't plant a lot of real heat lovers this year. Don't, you know, uh, yeah, no watermelons <laughs> or honeydews. Buy them <laughs> at the store. Okay, so we've talked, oh, what else have we talked about? Go ahead, Andy. Uh, we talked quite a bit about uh pH of your soil, uh, thinking about uh, what that is, um, and then using um, some amendment like the lime or granite dust to uh, adjust that. PH. Granite dust doesn't. Oh, it's not pH. pH. That is just potash. Okay. Um, but no, that was good that you remember that much. Um, yes, and then I, I talked about gypsum. If, if you need calcium, but you don't need to alter your pH. That's, you know, you would only know that if you got a very sophisticated soil test, you know, which some people like to do, and, it, and it, it's, it's good, but it's not necessary. I never have. Well, when I was 20 years old, I got a soil test. I sent it to the extension agents. Uh, I had subsoil. I didn't have topsoil. They had bulldozed. Back then, they, they, they bulldozed to build a house, and, and it was blue clay. I mean, it would have been a tennis court. And they didn't put anything back. You know, they didn't bulldoze back any topsoil to have, it was just left like that. So I transformed it by adding tons and tons and tons and tons of organic matter. But I had a soil test. And it came back that, um, you know, I needed, I needed lime, no surprise there. But they recommend the same amount for a sandy soil as they did for a heavy clay soil. And do you know what the particle difference is? There are 20,000 particles per one in a clay soil to a sandy soil. Whoa. Now that just didn't make any sense to me. You're, you're, you're giving me the same prescription for a soil that has 20,000 more particles than this one. So I, after that, I just ch chugged it. And I did get a very good um, brochure from the New York Lime Association. Um, if you want to read about this, um, it's in, I, I, I wrote for the Valley Reporter, I uh, had a gardening column, and it was July 20th, they printed this article about the, actually it was about invasive, controlling invasive plants. It's in the opinion page, uh, July 20th, um, 2000, 2017. But after that, yeah, I learned in the um, brochure put out by the Lyme Association in New York that the lime particle is the only particle that can get in between the clay particles. Clay particles sheets, they're platelets like this, and they can press, and there's no, absolutely no space between them, no air space at all. So it can't sustain life. The worms can't get down there, and they can't um, you know, do their thing and, and have organic matter and break it down, and that's, that's what makes a, a vital living soil. That won't happen. But the lime particle, for some reason, I think it's like tetra, how do you say that? Tetrapoidal? <laughs> like a, a four-sided uh, pyramid. Like the pyramids, you know? Uh, I love geometry, but I can't remember the name. Um, the lime particles are like that. And so they get in between those platelets and they force them to come apart. And they open everything up. And the air gets in, and the worms get in, and the water trickles out. And all of a sudden, you have this, this living uh, medium. And 
I was, fortunately, I was smart enough at 20 to know that, you know, 50, I mean, 20,000 particles to one, and you're recommending the same amount, you know, for each, and I thought, they really haven't done their homework, so I did mine, so, um, you guys can too, on your own places, so, uh, go ahead, do you have anything more? <laughs> um, we talked also about, uh, the wet soil is going to lead to a lot more disease and fungus, um, so to be prepared for that, thinking about, uh, Using elemental copper or neem tree oil as uh, antifungal. Yes, neem and N E E M. Uh, yes, because um, neem is both a, a broad spectrum insecticide and fungicide, so you can use it for you know critters. I mean bugs uh, too, uh, and it seems to be very selective. It only kills bad bugs. <laughs> it doesn't kill, which is really amazing, but. Uh, Yes, excellent. Uh, and Jack? Uh, another takeaway on, on that same subject for me was um, air. Of moving plants apart. I've, I've always had, I thought, not enough land. And so I'm always, if, you know, if they mm -hmm. tell me it should be 18 inch rows, ah, what the hell, 12 <laughs> yeah. inch. You know, I'm pushing things together. And, and, and last year in particular, I remember um, the, realizing that, that my uh, herb garden was suffering from things just being way too close. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, How was it suffering? Well, it, it, uh, um, it was brown. I mean, the plant, the lower third of the plants just died, I think, because huh. they were just okay. bumping into the next Plant. But I but I think that the core issue looking back was that they weren't getting any air in there. Okay. That you know, and so they stayed damp and and uh, um, and diseased. And I think you know this is how you measure this, but it seems like my herbs last year didn't have as much flavor. And okay. I wonder whether that wasn't just that they. You know, weren't out there in life. You know, they needed air around them. They were just too. All right, let's talk about that. Um, okay. Um, what was last summer like? Do, does anybody remember what the weather was last year? The growing season. Dry. Dry. Pretty warm. Pretty warm and dry. He's right. Uh, it was. I loved every minute of it. <laughs> <laughs> but I didn't have a garden last year. <laughs> That's probably why. Because you know, you had to go out. Okay. Um, definitely, you know, that we were talking about the space in a year when you have less light, you know, than we do here in Vermont ordinarily, which is only like one sunny day per week. Yeah. Places rated, that's what they say. That's not a whole lot of light. So, but we do get these freak little days when they say it's cloudy and we'll, we'll end up getting a few hours of afternoon sun and stuff. And, you know, that's enough. Um, you have to make up the difference in space, you're right, you know, because they need... All the leaves need the light, you know, above and, and below, you're right. And if it's at a premium, then you've got to sort of a, uh, accommodate that. Um, there's some plants you, you can crowd, and it's okay, you know, like lettuce and things, you know. But if, if you spread them out, you'll get a head. If you keep them crammed together, you get a lot of salads that you just snip, you know. Yeah. So you can play with the closeness. Um, one, if you, realize, if you have a raised bed and you've got 18 inches down, and your plant isn't going to spread out. It's a vertical grower. You can crowd them a lot, you know, more easily. But you, the one thing that's important is that you you're you're thinking about that now. You know, mm. you're aware of it. So you're gonna you're gonna see things that you didn't see before. You're gonna get hooked. This is good. <laughs> okay, pH, acidity. You know, it, 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 you have all that hot sunny weather. Those herbs should have been amazing last year and have a ton of flavor. So my guess is that your pH is too low. Because where do most herbs come from? Do we know? Mediterranean. You're right. Which ones in particular? Um, Oregano. Rosemary, thyme, thyme, thyme basil, all, all the ones we have. like. <laughs> yes, they're all from the Mediterranean. What's it like around the Mediterranean? Rocky and dry. Rocky and dry, and what's the pH? It's high because it's alkaline, limestone from you know the the 
from the uh, sea, you know, the ocean, it's, it's limestone. Um, I guess that isn't a foregone. I mean, you can be by the ocean and have something like Maine, you know, it's by the ocean and acidic. Um, but the Mediterranean just happens to be alkaline. Um, west of the Continental Divide in the U.S. is alkaline. So those people don't have to, what they have to worry about is lowering the pH, you know, uh, with things like coffee grounds and pine needles and, you know, whatever organic materials you can find to do that. Um, oh, you, you just gave me a clue. Okay. You've been guess, mulching with pine needles? Guess what I mulched with? Pine okay, needles. there you go. If you, have, if you have blueberries, azaleas, rhododendrons, Japanese irises, that would be perfect. But for Mediterranean herbs, you, you constantly lower their pH and, and then every time it rains, and rains. so <laughs> this will be fun this year. Try uh, lime it right now. Yeah. It's not too late. A lot of, you know, they used to say, oh, it takes a year before you realize any difference. That's not true. You can realize the difference almost immediately. I have. I've proved them wrong on that score, too. Uh, I love proving people wrong. I really do. <laughs> Especially when it comes to gardening, somebody says, I can't do that. And it's so easy. If you just know the, you know, pH, we talked a lot about that. That's really important around here, especially from California. Out there, everything's alkaline. Uh, things that just pop up and grow naturally. A lot of the um, wildflowers that I like to grow are California wildflowers. What we've been having here for spring has been winter in California. Typical winter weather. Mm -hmm. So this spring, like, um, was ideal spring to have planted. It's too late now, actually. Poppies, like as soon as the ground is bare, throw, you can throw a California poppies, Shirley poppies. Um, there's this plant called Phacelia um, campanularia, which is California bluebell, uh, gypsophila, baby's breath, um, larkspur, all these things. You know, you throw the seeds in, but early because they are 40 degree germinators and they need like 30 days or 40 degrees to germinate. So if you put them in now, they won't germinate. They might next year if you don't move them and don't change anything. They will next year actually because I've proved that too. But um, that's very exciting that you've picked up on the <laughs> pH, compaction, raised beds, lift and give them air above ground and below ground. It's almost as important not more so below ground than it is above ground. And they need air down at the base of their roots. You think they just need water. No, if they've if got a ton of water down there, they just rot and die. They need air, so you're on the right track. Okay, so we're trying to help Tanya catch up. Uh, oh, I just wanted to show you. These are pictures of a place I had on the river um, in Moortown. The house is still there, the gardens. One thing about gardens is they disappear <laughs> a year or two if you're not there to do them. But um, I had a very long sliver of land along the, the road. And, and there's the guardrail. Here's my long sliver of land. And then there are rocks, giant rocks down to the gorge. It was amazing. And um, so I, I planted every square inch. And that's what these pictures are. There's not really any order. But if you just get the sense of, you know, there's a house and this long strip. And some of them are from May and some of them are from June. There's a yellow. I loved um, alpine plants. I love alpine plants. I love Mediterranean. The first thing I do is dump a ton of lime. <laughs> so there I had tons of uh, Mediterranean plants. Roses. That's the reason why people can't grow roses in Vermont. It's not because it's too cold. It's because they don't lime. They don't raise the pH high enough. And there's another trick. You have to plant the graft ball. There's a ball on the rose where a, the, the species hybrid has been grafted on to um, a um, species stock. Like there are wild roses all over the world, okay? Some of them are so uh, uh, rampageous that they've been used to graft like a hybrid tea onto, because the combination of the two of them make them much hardier in the sense of able to take up, you know, a lot of stresses. Hardiness doesn't mean just cold, it means you know, all kinds of plant stresses, like tons of water or no water. Okay, so um, plant that root ball one inch below the ground for every 10 degrees below zero that we go in the winter. Oh my. Historically, we've always gone 
30 below. It has not been unusual to see a few days of 30 below. We didn't have any of that this year. The nights were really warm all winter long, the, you know, all spring long. We haven't had a frost in two months. People are walking around complaining about how cold it was. They don't know what cold is. They don't even tell the difference. You know, they're on their phones so much, they can't tell when it's really cold. This year was brutal because of the pattern that went up and down and up and down, ice and rain and snow and ice and rain and snow. It was treacherous, it was, but it wasn't really cold. Anyway, um, put that root ball two to three inches below the ground. Line the shit out of it. Put some in the bottom, put some on the top. Really fertilize it. If you put those bones in your, in your uh, wood stove, like I told you, use that bone meal. Get granite dust, wood ashes. Um, my favorite fertilizer is from Agway. Well, I, get it, I actually get it at Guy's because it's less expensive, but um, it's composted poultry manure, which is a huge waste problem in this country. And um, it's the best. And it smells good, and they're little pellets, and you get them in 50 pound bags. And that's all I use. I use that in line. So um, this stuff, just pour it on, you know, mix it in. <laughs> you can't hurt your plants. I mean, unless you had real little seedlings, I think, and you dump fresh manure around or something. This stuff, I've never burned anything. I've never had chl chlorotic plants, uh, which chlorotic you can get from too much lining. It locks iron in, and it's, it's bad. But I've never seen that. So don't, if people say, you know, no, 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 you shouldn't, you shouldn't, you shouldn't use lime because, you know, it'll get chloride. Don't listen to them. Can I ask you one thing about these photos? Sure. You're right here on the road. Yeah. We're, we're, I, I've been wondering about um, planting things right by the road because of the salt. Don't worry. Don't worry. All that stuff is, it gets a steady diet of salt. I didn't lift off the salt every spring. I'm right on the road. Yeah. Beautiful. All of that, yeah, that's called Raubritter. It's a German, it's, it only blooms once and it's not fragrant, but I just love it. It has a bazillion flowers. Um, yeah, the salt trucks go by all the time, all winter long. Uh, they dumped salt and sand. Uh, it never bothered anything I grew. You can't grow conifers, you know, uh, but okay. the salt didn't hurt them. I didn't find anything that hurt the salt, you know. Maybe, actually maybe asparagus. So I think all these things die back all, yes. all the way. All yes, the see there's a picture where there's nothing, you see the guardrail and there's nothing growing below it. That's May. <laughs> and then it fills in by, the, the other pictures were taken I think in July. So by early July, it goes from nothing to spectacular, which is, we have 90 perfect days here as a growing season, and uh, a lot of things can happen. So? 90 days. Hmm. Kind of. June, July, August. The season sort of has extended itself because of the climate variations, you know. Um, like, now we won't get a frost later until, it used to be end of August. Um, sometimes they're middle of August. Now it's the end of September, sometimes the end of October. But the reason why we can't extend our growing season is because the diseases are still there and they still run their course. And by the, you know, the, the time that the frost used to come, the diseases end up affecting the plants to the point where we can't, you, you can't really extend the season unless you've protected them against disease or grown them in a greenhouse or they're naturally resistant. So, um, so you can't really expect that either. Uh, <laughs> anybody else? <laughs> uh, okay, so let's see. What else can we cover? Um, did we talk? Oh, we haven't talked about lighting. You know, light. Um, where to place things. Um, in a year like this, um, you really don't want to place another stress on your plants, things that need full sun, you know. Um, don't put them in a part sun place, unless it's like noon to six, you know, southwest exposure. Yes, you do, you get 25% more sun and heat if your place slopes southwest. Isn't that amazing? Mm. 
course, every place I've always had is all sloped northwest. <laughs> but, yeah. but if you do have a place that slopes southwest, um, you do. You get 25% more heat and light just because of, of the incline, I mean, the pitch. Um, the place with, where all the poppies are, I have, oh, I have another shot of that. It might take me too long to find it. Um, but that house is across the street from the red one, and it is on the north side of a cliff. It built into the cliff. <laughs> so it's just dark. But on the edge of the road, the sun would clear, and it would get, from the uh, west, it would get like two hours at the end, in the afternoon, of intense sun. I didn't know what I could do there. I, for a while, was just planting plants that just shade, right? You know, because two hours of sun in the afternoon is called part shade. You know, it's not enough to call it part sun, and that's the difference. If you have four hours of sun in the afternoon, it's called part sun. Um, like, because the ideal times are from like 10 to 4 is, you know, your, your intense. If, if you have noon to 4, you have part sun. Uh, if you only have 10 to noon, you have part shade. Um, so I had never tried anything in this space. I was trying, you know, surefire jack in the pulpits. <laughs> I, this one that I called the candy jack. It's pink and white star. I loved it. Thrive there. But uh, I decided one year, the last year I was there, I want to I wanna see what it'll do, you know, pack seeds. I had seeds. Sweet William which one looks a really high pH, you have to dump the lime on it. But I did, I just dumped the lime on this, it was heavy clay in the shade, um, one, maybe two hours of sun at the end of the day. I understand, people were stopping to take pictures of it, seriously, they were sending them out, I mean, it was famous. The whole thing just, they were like three feet high, they couldn't have more, they weren't um, you know, unnaturally lengthy you know, because of the lack of sun. Amazing, and um, the Cadillac, you know, they, they bought the seeds from full sun. You have to have full sun. So I had to write to them and say, no, you don't. You can do it up here in Vermont on the shady side of a cliff if you have two <laughs> two hours at the end of the day. So don't be afraid, you know, especially you know when, when these trying times um, of weather, to try things like that. You know, um, pay attention to how much light. Your, your, your spaces get and when they get it. Try and maximize um, what you can do about that. Like there's certain vegetables, you know, that, that will do really well in, in sort of a sh part sun. You know, maybe they shade all morning and get a few hours in the afternoon. Um, they're like green beans and zucchini and I think, I think beets. You know, you, you can play around, but there are some things that will. And you can find lists, you know, look on, in books. Go to used bookstores. <laughs> That's really fun. That's where you find really great gardening books, uh, especially the Rodale ones. Um, I put them to memory when I was young, pretty much. Um, and especially memorizing pH requirements and, and light requirements of plants. Um, make mental notes. Where is the sun? Where are the shady parts of the building? What time of day, what month, you know, what happens? Um, because you're going to need to maximize the light. Uh, like I said, I just planted, I love planting roses, and uh, I just planted five next to the door of my gallery on Winooski Street. And I'm, I'm curious to see what's going to happen, because uh, there's three climbers and uh, two floor bundas. And like I said, this, this plot was where the dogs eliminated, the neighborhood dogs were eliminated last year. So I figured if I put roses in, I pegged them down. That's another trick uh, where you can maximize light if you have rows. Uh, this is a technique that I, I, I love using. Is you, the, you let the canes get to their full height. But they, most of them won't reach more than six to eight feet here, you know, in our 90, perfect 90 days. And you can peg them down um, by using like, like croquet hoops or um, something a little heavier. You can use a pencil rod and cut it, you know, and make these hoops. And actually bend the canes down and 
hold them down with these hoops, and they will form a new shoot in each one of the plant nodes all along the branch. So you'll increase your flowers by 10%, I mean, uh, tenfold, 100%, seriously, if you peg them down like that. That's what I did um, in, in so many of those pictures. Mm -hmm. um, and then will they root from the time? No, they won't root. Um, um, most of them, at least in those circumstances, on the edge of the road, uh, a lot of the you know the, the snow and the piles and stuff that was dumped broke a lot of the canes, um, and I would, usually I would only have you know half as many as I started with the, the following year, but uh, I don't know they, they they never lasted you know more than a, two or three years without getting broken or or you know it, just expending their life. Expectancy. You sort of want to keep pruning ones that have bloomed a couple of times. It depends on the on the rows because there's 16 classifications and they all have different little idiosyncrasies. Um, Can I ask you to yes. go back a second? Sure. You were saying about the roses. Yes. That the node between the the root stock and, and the, the the top stock. The ball graft. You wanted to um, bury it one inch for each. Degree of freeze? No, each ten, each ten degrees. Each ten degrees. So it, it it's a, a so traditionally three or four inches. Would yeah, be three. I think three. Three. Three would be about perfect. I wouldn't go any deeper okay. than that because mm -hmm. if you go deeper, what happens is it, it might grow a shoot off of the the, the rose that was it was grafted onto. Ah. And and when the one that's grafted on top, oftentimes it dies in Vermont because people haven't planted it deep enough, deeply enough. Right. And, and, and the top dies, and what happens is the understock keeps growing, and usually it'll be like 25 feet, and it'll grow everywhere, and it'll have these pale sort of cup-like maroon things that, you know, aren't really what you had in mind. That is the species rose that was used, you know, specifically to graft onto. It's not the, the one that you... Stock. Yes, for the rootstock, because it'll, it's indestructible. Whereas the, the hybrid teas that come from China originally, you know, they're... They're a little fussier, and they're, they're they're dainty, and they need you know, they're not as indestructible. So so when you combine those two, it's a ball. You can actually see where the two have been. It, it looks like a ball. Make sure that's a, you know two or three inches below the ground. Now, if you live in Florida, it's the opposite, which is funny. Or in warmer places, they have to have that root ball above the ground, or they you know, automatically lose the the graft. But um, up here, keep it below. And uh, you'll be, you can tell those people who say you can't grow roses in Vermont to get lost. I I bought a bunch from um, Evergreen Gardens. They stopped buying and selling them because people couldn't grow them. I had them for 20 years. I, the only reason I don't have them anymore is because I had to sell the house. And um, anyway, um, the David Austin collection, I don't know if any of you are planning on planting roses, but the David Austin roses, for some reason, are, are particularly um, very sturdy up here. You know, they they uh, really do well. I had, I don't know, six or eight of those. Um, piece of English. Where do you like to get them? Reader. Well, there aren't that many places unless I go online. I used to go, you know, I, I, I had a huge collection of antiques. <laughs> I, was, I had 75, actually, and uh, all along the sand and the salt and the guardrail. And um, 20, 30 years ago, there were several places that I went to that I don't think exist anymore. You, you buy them bare root and they'd send them in the fall mm -hmm. or in the spring. And that's actually ideal. You get them real early and put them in real early. I, w I waited too long this year. They're not selling them anymore. Um, that's it. For bare root. It's okay, um, I got some really great ones at Abway. Um, I just got five uh, that I'm real happy about. So they probably still have some. Uh, yeah, most places online, it's the end of the season. Up here, you know, it's we're so far behind that. But they're sold out. Actually, yeah, right yeah, exactly. Yeah, you sort of have to start in fall, or you know, when the catalog first comes. <laughs> yeah. So, um, but I would try Agway. 
Do you have anything left? Uh, another place, a little wild uh, flower farm in Charlotte. I'm not sure about the roses, but they have a, a really good inventory online. They ship. Uh, and they have a really good inventory of, of seeds to plant in shade, flowering seeds. Uh, I'm really getting into shady areas. Roses are really amazing because they really love growing on the edge of a forest, <laughs> on the edge of a woodland. In nature, that's where you see them. Here in Vermont, you'll see them because there are ones that see themselves and that will you'll find. They'll be on the edge of a woodland. They, they like a lot of sun, but they don't like intense heat and, you know, to be out there, you know, in the dead of the heat of the day. So in the gorge, I was on the edge of the woodland, both sides, and I got, um, the maximum was three quarters of a day of sunlight, but it was enough. I didn't get as many flowers as people get, you know, somewhere where they have a lot more light, but I got enough to make me happy and enough to keep them alive, you know, so... I thought it was enough. <laughs> uh, anyway, anything else? I mean, we can keep going. Uh, um, what uh, this year, are there some plants, uh, thinking of my vegetable garden, that maybe I should be thinking about buying starts instead of starting from seed? Uh, oh, I would go to the Cape Farm, Kate Farm truck sales. They have, I think it's tomorrow. I don't know, maybe the, it might be the last one. Yes. Um, if you don't make their truck sales, they might have, I mean, go to their site and see if they still have them. Because they'll put in a, in a, in a peat pack um, you know, 50 or 100 beets and spinach and you can just take these little things that have their second leaves. Oh, this is another tip. Um, the ideal time to transplant things you know, seedlings, is when they have their first set of true leaves. Every plant gets baby leaves, you know, like we get baby teeth, and then we get, and they're called cotyledons, the first one. They don't look like the leaves are going to look like. They're just first leaves. As soon as the plant emits the second, the first true leaf, that is sort of like the ideal time to transplant it. You can transplant many things at that point that you cannot any further along. I'm thinking of seedlings like carrots, beets, spinach, all those things. If it's raining like this, this is optimal transplant weather. This is the year to get your bushes and trees, and this is what I was talking about here. Plant roses, or plant flowering shrubs and fruit trees and all kinds of things um, that need a lot of water. Asparagus, put an asparagus bed in. Mm. Buy a pack of asparagus seeds. They'll love this weather, and they'll all sprout. And by the end of the season, you will have... Um, you, you'll save yourself 40 bucks buying the plants, you know. If you bought mm -hmm. the plants, um, if you just sow the seeds, um, they'll do really well right now. They're 70 degree germinators. They'll just poof, they'll pop up and all of them. <laughs> so, uh, so there's good things and bad things, you know. Anything else? <laughs> I'm going all day, you can tell. This is not rehearsed. Two. <laughs> We're here. <laughs> I'm not used to having somebody listen to me one and really <laughs> like hearing what I'm having to say. <laughs> so, anyway, um, I'm still as excited as I was. Like I said, I, I didn't grow up gardening. I mean, I got sort of dragged to all these famous gardens in Europe and all. I mean, I'm not <laughs> bragging here. I'm just saying this is what it was. Um, but then my grandma had this amazing garden in Cannes. You know, I lived right above the movie festival, up a few blocks. That's where my grandmother's house was, and that's where we had to go, because she was her grandmother. And she had an amazing garden, but I wasn't allowed to go in it. I wasn't allowed to touch anything. I wasn't allowed to do this. She had a gardener, and stay away, and go play with yourself somewhere, you know? It's like never any sort of instruction or encouragement to sort of do anything. So there was this vacant chicken coop that was just dirt, dust. It was powder dry and I used to go sit in there for hours and just play with dirt. It's kind of pathetic now. I mean I think about it, but but I guess the you know the desire was, point. was a starting point but, but I didn't know what it was, you know, mm -hmm. until I uh, married a dairy farm here in Moortown. <laughs> but um 
it's never too late. And it, you can just get obsessed and you'll be amazed at how much the natural world will uh, open up for you. Things you've never seen before, never noticed before, in, in, in insects, you know, in plants, and diseases, you know, things that they'll do, not do, that um, you can work around and uh, beat them at their own game, kind of. Um, Chris, as I said earlier, you, you're encouraging me to think about trying to adjust my expectations and what I'm going to do with my gardening mm -hmm. to the realities of the weather that okay. I'm confronting as opposed to trying to force my preconceptions about when I'm going to do what on, on just the, on the ground no matter what. But I was thinking about, uh, I don't have much detail about this at all, but my father told me stories about how in where he grew up in Poland, um, they had uh, uh, communal space for gardening. And the way they dealt with it was um, they uh, mounded, uh, they made mounds, and each family got a mound or X number of mounds. But, and I don't remember how tall they were, but I remember his talking about how they planted um, sort of in session, you know, right. uh, and working down the mountain, right. and, and, the, and the mounds were big enough that they could get in with a long trowel and, and work all of it, but they never wow. walked on yeah. the soil. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm thinking, oh, maybe that's why they were doing that. Yeah. Um, I mean, obviously it controlled things, you know, you get one raised bed, you get one mound. Um, but also it meant that they could adjust you know, if it was a particularly wet season, then they could plant that mound differently, mm -hmm. and, and the amount of wetness down at the bottom was going to be different than the top. Anyway, maybe I'll give that a try sometime. Well, that's exciting. You just had a flash of that. Well, and and the, the other obvious is that you have a lot more area when you have a big mound. Then if, if you had a flat circle on the ground, you know, you... you yeah, yeah. What is it, the pie school? Pi squared? No, is it <laughs> pi uh, times the radius? Is no. Anyway, you have the area of a, of a circle, flat area on the ground. Right. It's going to be a lot less than uh, yep. the dome, yep. and so it, it's a way to maximize space, yep. which Europeans have had to do a lot more than we have, yep. obviously, and are still having to do. Um, that's pretty interesting. Yeah. Um, I went to an Abenaki planting class at the Historical Society, oh, yeah? and it was really interesting. They talked about they used mound systems, and they would use it to increase so the corn, you know, the three sisters. But they mm -hmm. would um, some of those ground cherries. They they replicated it <clears throat> recently. Okay. They would repel some of the pests that the other plant uh -huh. inside would get. Uh -huh. So interplanting them in a different way. Huh. Really interesting. Very good point that I completely left out. Companion planting is another way that um, you know you can protect your plants. I I used to know every companion plant pair you know that was out there, but I, it's not in my memory to tell you this morning. But but I can tell you where the books are, which my dad told me. You know. You don't have to know everything to be a genius. You just have to know where to look it up. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Ruth Stout is a, uh, was a gardener who really uh, promoted a lot of companion planting. And she's very, uh, she's kind of popular today uh, with planters because she advocated a no-till system. She didn't till her soil. You just add stuff and just keep adding it on top and it breaks down and feeds everything and breaks down. And, and you just don't disturb that, you know, layer, layered, system, which most of the world operates that way. I mean, the, the, the natural world, the, go out in the woods, that's what's going on. Um, so, companion planting, that's another way to minimize, you know, predators that are, are attracted to weakened plants because they're not getting enough sun, they've got too much water, they're too close together, the pH is too low. All those stresses, you know, compound and then make your plants more attractive to, that's, you know, that's something that really never ceases to amaze me is that insect pests will not be attracted 
to plants that are having all the needs met. They just simply do not find them attractive. It must be a scent. I don't know, you know, I haven't studied the plant world on a molecular level that much, but they must give off something, emit something that maybe a, I might, but I don't, do these insects, can they smell? I don't know, but somehow they do. And they go for plants that are in distress. So if you see insects, you know, going after <coughs> plants, figure out why is this plant in distress, if you can, to, the, to your best of your ability. Um, I've noticed, I mean, I used to grow, I've gone through different phases, and, and this red house, before the guardrail was put there, actually the guardrail was not there when I bought the place. It happened five or six years later. And I, um, I like to grow this Scottish thistle. <laughs> It's outlawed in most of the West of the United States because it, it's rampageous, you know, and it's self-seeds, it's a thistle. And, and especially in the uh, states where they have a lot of grazing, you know, animals grazing and stuff, it's really a menace. So then they grow eight feet tall. <laughs> so I have pictures of them. But what I notice is where plants overlap, where they weren't getting enough space, the, lo the locusts, the, the uh, cicadas, the, the uh, grasshoppers devoured them devoured them and they loved it because they would get kind of limp uh -huh. and they didn't have those razor edged uh, you know picks those things got soft you couldn't feel them <coughs> when the plant was not getting its light and the locusts just chewed them up for breakfast and I thought isn't that something mm. um, I've noticed slugs slugs will devour your plants if the pH isn't right um, you got to really line, especially if you want to grow Brussels sprouts or the broccoli family, you've got to really line. Or if, if you see the slugs on them, because it's raining every day, wood ashes. Just keep wood ashes every day. And, and wood ashes will quick line for you. They will raise the pH. It doesn't last very long. That's why you need to add you know, the lime too. Um, but they do deter the slugs. One, because they're gritty. Too, because they raise at the same time they're improving your situation you know you want that duality there you don't want to just kill something and go use you know a, a, like name for instance just because you want to get rid of the bug you want to figure out why is it in distress um, what could I do you know what are the possibilities go through your head you know, what could it possibly be you know, it's like you've got a little baby you know, there's only a few things that really, that really uh, you can turn to um, that they need. It's kind of like with plants. There aren't that many things that they need. So try and, you know, and read and, you know, find books that delve with the things that, you know, we've brought up today. Uh, I sound like I'm winding down. We don't have to. I mean, if anybody wants to leave, just ask me more questions. I'm trying to help. Maybe I have more pictures. Talk, if you will, um, about weeds. Okay. Oh, I love talking about weeds. Um, <laughs> I, I've got a, a, a garden plot that we uh, was for 25 years of turf. Uh, not grass, but just random field, but right. it was plowed. Right. Um, and we tilled it for the first time last year. And um, God, the weeds were just invasive okay. little ships. I'm stopping you right there. And, go ahead. What were the weeds? I don't know. That's the key right there. You've got to find out what were those weeds. One, it tells you a lot about your soil. It tells you a lot about your microclimate. Um, how do you find out what those weeds are? Well, um, there are books, again, um, that show them. There's a, a super one called Weeds and What They Tell You that was published uh, here in Vermont. Um, I think it's Weeds and What They Tell You. And I think it was published by the University of Vermont. I might be wrong. But the, the key is to have the pictures of them as seedlings. Mm -hmm. um, I won Parks, I've had for 30, 40 years, Parks uh, Guide to Seed Sowing, whatever, that I use primarily now just to look at this, the picture of the seedling. Um, what happens when you, if you familiar yourself, familiarize yourself with cultivated seedlings, flowers that you plant, vegetables that you plant, you'll, you'll recognize the, um, if, 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 if the flowers that you grow or the vegetables that you grow from other places, you know, brought packed seeds and maybe they were grown, I don't know, 
the south or the west or somewhere else. Um, they're another cultivar of a family that might grow wild here, like impatience, okay? Impatience, everybody, a lot of people grow up impatience in the shade. Jewelweed, jewelweed is in the impatience family. If you don't know what jewelweed is, it's a, it's a tall, it grows about this tall, it's translucent stem, um, has little orange flowers at the top. It grows everywhere, especially where poison ivy is, which is yeah. something I love. It's an antidote for poison ivy. You can actually take it. It's got. It's like the owl of the north is what I call it. Mm -hmm. You take it and you make a poultice and you can smash it around and put it on if you if you have been exposed to poison ivy. You know, look around. If you oh shoot, it is. Find some jewelry, rub it on there, and it 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 it, it uh, renders the the oil useless or it doesn't. Uh, you don't get the infection. Um, try and learn to recognize seedlings, especially when you plant things in your garden. Try and say, okay, here's a, a poppy and here's a marigold and here's a green bean. How are they different? What do they look like when they come up? Look at the pictures. Um, I'm trying to think. Wildflower Seeds Farm from uh, Texas. I, I use them a lot because there again, they have little pictures of all of their seedlings. And so if you see something that looks like that, you can say, oh, you know, I'm out in a, uh, a field, and uh, I'm getting Rudbeckia, you know, which is you know the black-eyed Susans. They're popping up everywhere. Mallows will pop up, um, you know. And if you want them, you can use them in your design, you know, all the wildflowers. But it's really exciting to learn to recognize because you'll see, you'll learn so much about what your little mi micro climate is like by what falls there and grows naturally. So you, what you can do is take that information and, and plant other members of the same family. Plants are in big families. And that's why the Latin was developed to, uh, to identify them all. And so impatience, <coughs> I think it's imperialis, it's jewelweed. Uh, but you might plant impatience, I don't know what the, the flowers that we buy impatience are called, I don't know what their species name is, but um, let's see, I'm trying to think. I discovered this wind poppy. It's a California poppy from Baja. That's where it, it's indigenous to. It seeded in this wall, this north-facing wall that I had on the river here that was below the road. How did it get there? I have no idea. A car from California maybe passing by? A bird that had migrated east? Um, don't know. But, uh, or a combination of the above, you know, a car that was passing, maybe it landed on somebody in California, made it to Vermont, and the wind blew it, you know. Um, gorgeous flower. But when I saw it, I said, that looks like a poppy, because I knew what poppies look like when they, when they start coming up. And you can do that too. Um, one, if, if it's too late this year to plant poppies, you can look at books and look at the pictures and see what a seedling looks like. And that's how I knew this one. It's copper, it's gorgeous. It loves the shade. Um, that was a total gift. And there's plenty of them out there in each one of your places. And you get excited, it's fun. Um, my fi one of my favorite garden books is called Garden Lilies. And it was written and published in 1946 in, in the South London Dairy, Vermont by a couple named Esther and I think it's Tom. I don't remember his name. <laughs> Esther, that's my daughter's name, I remember her name. McNeil. And uh, they published a book called Garden Lilies in Vermont 75 years ago when we were having those 35 below degree periods every winter on all the garden lilies that you can grow in Vermont and it's extensive. You can't even buy most of these lilies in cultivation. You know, you go to the stores and you get one or two, you know, things that are popular and easy. Or you get Casablanca, it's white, and everybody likes the name. But there's this whole world of, of lilies from around the world that plant hunters went and found and discovered and brought back like in the 6th, 17th century, you know, in the <coughs> 18th centuries um, that are out there, you know, especially, if, you know, if we had the, Capability online, you can 
contact these people and buy them, you know. So I got really obsessed with this Japanese woodland lily that I saw in this book, you know. It was, it was black and white, it was a bad picture. But I read about it and I thought, oh, I've got to have that. I've got the perfect place for it. And, and I got it from a doctor out in Michigan. I got it from somebody who knew somebody. Who, and they were beautiful bulbs, monsters. And I planted them in the perfect place. Well, the moles like them too. <laughs> no. They're like, nobody told me, you know, like the most delicious food for them. It was like caviar or something. Else. But I, I learned how to, you know, I put them in a cage, you put them in like a wired cage, and then by the time they've grown up through the cage, they're no longer attracted to the, to the rodents. But, um, you know, the world is out there, <laughs> the plants. And uh, there's a lot we can do up here. What we can't. Don't focus on what we can't have or things that are marginal to here or pushing the limits, you know, that you had when you were in California or something, you know. Don't do that. It's it's counterproductive. And um <coughs> anybody else? Anything else? Uh I'm trying to think of something I might have forgotten. Uh, I have uh, at my house I have a I bought a new house a couple of years ago, and apparently they had some strawberries, but they okay. didn't really maintain this bed very well. Okay. I'm kind of looking through it, and it hasn't been weeded well in the last couple of years. And okay. It's like the plants aren't, aren't in great condition, and I, I was thinking about transplanting them into an organized okay. fashion. Okay. Good idea. Um, mulching it. Am I still in a time frame that will work? For yes, this year? it's perfect this year to do that. That's a perfect thing. And you've waited long enough. I mean, it's late enough in the season. You can tell which are the, the mother plants, the bigger ones. You might not want to transplant those. They sort of have a, you know, they get exhausted after a few years. If you have a lot of runners, snip off the runners and make a whole row of the runners. Um, raise your pH or they won't be sweet. Why? You know, um, use a lot of organic matter, lighten it up. They don't like heavy soil. They, they like sandy soil. Um, do you know what your soil type is like where you want to put them? Not in that exact location. No. Okay, so you would want to check that. If it's wet and standing water there, they won't like that. Don't do it. Mounds, you can mound up, mound it up, they might. Um, if it's really heavy, I would I would get some sand. It's cheap. Mix that in, compost, that fertilizer I was telling you, lime it. Um, I just do extremely well. <laughs> this is really good weather. Not when they're ripening, you know, mm -hmm. but for developing the berries, this is ideal. Mm -hmm. <coughs> so. I, I have just a random question oh, about if you great. want to, um, we have a lot of lawn right now for, to use as lawn, but we were thinking of letting at least part of it go to meadow and seeding it with wildflowers. Okay. But I'm curious, I mean, it's thick, like you were talking about your sod that had been there a long time. Do you, would you, you wouldn't see it on top of that, would you break no. it up? I mean, it's you'd a have big to, expand. You'd have to probably till it or remove it by hand. That's how I, I do. It's awful. Not everybody does this, but um, yeah, you'd have to remove the sod and then then you can, can you broadcast till it. Un but you had problems when you just till a field like yeah, tilling wasn't enough. <laughs> it, it kept coming back. Oh yeah, it doesn't. It, you'd have to plow it. Tilling, you just get eight million pieces when you only had fifty before, yeah. and they're all over the place. Um, plowing. I, 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 I don't know how impatient you are, but something that uh, was recommended to me after the struggle was if, if you're willing to donate a year to it to put black plastic down. Yeah. And just leave it for a whole year, and 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 then you can work with it because it's all I can't leave that. it's all done. You no, <laughs> but I have actually done that on crabgrass in California, and I don't use plastic. I use cardboard. Uh huh. But it's dry enough there that it yeah didn't decompose fa too fast uh -huh. and start work. But we what's the on top. what's the land? I mean, what's the land like that you want to? What's the soil like? Do you know? It's actually very fortunate. It's sandy. Right? It's nice. perfect. I would plow it. Get it plowed. Don't get a monster tractor, but you know somebody who has a small to medium-sized tractor, plow it because that just turns it all down and down. 
here you'll have it'll compost and, okay. and you'll have a little you know compost a little fertilizer down there eventually when the, the roots get down there yeah. you might even want to lime it plow it and lime it again okay. and then broadcast it okay. um, like I said it's too late for a lot of you know for the 40 degree uh, germinators but it's it's perfect timing for the 70 degree germinators Vermont wildflower seeds in Charlotte would if, if you told them that information they would probably have a mix for you that would you know give you the most flowers that you could do around here in June yeah um, what do you do in that case do you just broadcast the yeah seeds? that's what I do um, I well I, I broadcast some actually you'll get to see them I mean it, behind the blue green part of the there's a blue green building across from the main entrance to the library. I've put a little garden in there. Uh, you would not believe the trouble I had with the neighbors and the landladies and Lord. Um, anyway, it's very <laughs> little, but I did broadcast five blue things. I just was in this blue thing. Um, annuals. Um, one forget-me-not, an annual forget-me-not. And another thing about plants, there's a lot of members to every plant family. Forget-me-nots have annual members, biennial members, and perennial members, you know, so if you have all of those, you can have, you can have uh, forget-me-nots all year long, you know, the whole season until November, December, um, if you know that and plant the different forms. It, it, the same true with other plants, you know. Um, but I did the forget-me-nots, two forms, the Chinese forget-me-nots and Sinoglossum fermentalis, I think it's called, and Myosotis, uh, anyway. Um, the, the California bluebells and um, there's one more bachelor buttons and these are all very simple annuals that pop up and and, and, and do magic in in very short period of time by early mid July. Um, and you just went. Yeah, but I made sure the ground was clean. You know, I mean, I cleared off all the sod. I pull it out by hand, and then I lined it and fertilized it and sort of lightly rake it and then and you can tell you read the packages because. A lot of plants are germinators, darkness, some of them like light, so you gotta pay attention to that too. Um, and I wanted to talk about the weeds a little more because you had asked about the weeds. One thing that's really amazing about weeds is, well I've always thought that they sort of gravitate towards each other, they have this like homing device because you'll, you'll find that um, the weeds will resemble the plants that you've planted in a certain spot. There'll, there'll be a, a weed that looks identical to the plant that you've planted. And like yesterday I was working for somebody, I was doing a job weeding, and um, there was like bergamot, the bee balm. But there was a weed that looks identical to the bergamot growing right up with the, um, the bee balm. So you need to learn, because they're gonna, they're gonna mimic, they're gonna grow in the places that are ideal for, for them. Seeds are just gonna pop up, and that's, if, it's, if you've given them really good situations to, 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 to grow, they're going to do it. And so um, your particular site has a certain amount of light and has a certain like orientation and has a certain slope and has all these little certain things that is going to attract or, or cause um, seedlings to pop up, good, bad, and indifferent. So you want to you wanna learn what those are and um, the easiest way to get rid of them too. There are techniques to weeding. <laughs> they all take energy. <laughs> <laughs> it's true, they do. It's true, I, I, uh, I was working with this guy for just for a couple of days because he wanted somebody to come and I said, you know, I think you, what you're really looking for is a hacker, you know, like a teenage hacker here or a college kid or something, you know, because, you know, I'll do it for you, but I'm not doing it for cheap and, I'm, and I have techniques that I'm really fast, so I can accomplish a lot, and you think you're paying out a lot more now, well wait till you get the hacker, you know what I'm yeah, saying, so. Yeah. But, um. Well, I, ha I have had a lot of success with mulching and planting on top. Okay. Either oh, sheet mulch. mulching. Oh, really? Like, what have you, um. I've used paper, I've used cardboard, newspaper, landscape cloth, and then mulching on top of it. Uh -huh. And then, you know, you can only, you wouldn't be able to broadcast that way, but if you have a more formal 
and you just break I through did, all of that yeah. and plant you it. Stick there. plants in? Oh. What kind of plants did you use? I, I planted lots of things like that, different, uh, I had different trees, um, fruit trees, um, grasses, um, you know, ground cover is hard, but after a period of time, the mulch will break down and you can grow on top of it, but you don't have all that sod grassy kind of stuff coming yeah. through. Um, I didn't dis discriminate, I planted everything that Now was that elsewhere? Oh, in California. So I don't know. Well, I'd be that. curious, I, it sounds like you have some really good techniques, you know, along those lines, and it'd be really interesting to, to see what you discover here, what happens. Yeah, I'll try. Are you ready? Well, I have more space here, so that's why, I mean, that oh. was a, a smaller, it was, you know, an eighth of an acre, so mm -hmm. I was just using landscape beds and things like that. So I'd, I'm curious, we do have a larger space that I want to do something with that I'm daunted by the number of weeds that are there now. Uh -huh. So, different time. <laughs> I, they're invasives, those damn weeds, and, 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 and they, I, I think the plants that we're trying to force are, are, are not necessarily native to the situation, so they're struggling. They're at a disadvantage. You know, to, and, and, and the weeds, oh, they just take advantage of every, yeah. you know, I just turn my back and they're, they come back crackling <laughs> little shits. <laughs> That's true. Well, there's a time for everything. Like, I uh, removed this sod, you know, that was over there from my little rose strip there. And I, and I broadcast the blue mix with these roses and I, I planted some lilies. Uh, <laughs> and dahlias. And I've noticed that the, the, the seeds from the sod, I mean, it was weed grass, you know. There's a bazillion of them. They're all tiny. That's the time you get them. You can't wait. But your gardens cannot fit into your plants, you know. And like you were saying, you've been trying to do that. No, you, you, you're the, the, you have to fit into their, the gardens. <laughs> you have to obey natural law. <laughs> natural laws are dictating what has to happen here. Yeah. And so if you have a struggle with that, I would suggest you don't garden because it's just. <laughs> <laughs> find something else. Yes, you need to find it somewhere else. <laughs> but <clears throat> if you get them right now, like I'm going to go home and hoe that area because I want to mulch it, but it's been too wet to mulch, you know. I want to wait uh, until it dries out a little bit. And so I see those bazillion of those things. But if I take a hoe, a little onion hoe right now, and they'll be gone, you know, because they won't grow. So, yeah, the trick is not to let them get ahead of you. When you do weed, make sure you go down far enough and get the entire root system. Um, and you can actually minimize, you can minimize your weeds to be manageable. You can. Uh, I get to the point in my rose, in those rose gardens, I, I didn't have any weeds, very few, um, because I used plants as a mulch, and that's another thing to consider, you know. I hate this, this red bark stuff is so awful, and in fact that it's just, you know, like raised beds, you know, everybody uses it because everybody uses it, and everybody puts it around their trees. That's the worst thing, make a mound around your tree, it makes the water run off, and then it makes it, 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 that mulch actually soaks up and absorbs all the water, which in a year like this might be a good thing, but I don't know, I would find something else, grass clippings or any kind of composted stuff where I used leaves, you know, I, I defied, I tried to defy uh, law, but I, I used leaves. For years, my husband told me, oh, use leaves. And everybody says, no, you can't use leaves. Uh, they're diseased. Well, when I use these other techniques, soil amendments, the rock powders that I talked about before you came in, um, the two um, disease sprays that are you know, certified organic, um, elemental copper and neem. Now, here's another thing, elemental copper. This is this is huge, significant. You've got to uh, you've got to put it in water. That's acidic because copper is acidic, and 
I think it is, isn't it? Anyway, you need to match, you need to use rainwater with the copper. If you use tap water that is coming from a deep well and has a ton of limestone in it, which most wells do, calcium carbonate is down there, um, <clears throat> it, it cancels out the, 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 the effectiveness of the copper. Oh. You have to put, you have to use it with a, um, an acidic uh, water, which is easy to come by. Just use rain water, don't use tap water if you're mixing this elemental copper stuff. Um, I would f I would really deter using um, chemical fertilizers in a year like this. You you have to do it almost every other day because you know the real miracle of them and it, it gives you a real punch. It's like a a, a two shot espresso with you know three sugars. It it, it just gives you a, this real blast of, of of energy and and nutrients that the plants respond to. But it doesn't last long, and if it rains, it's leached, it leaches out really quickly. So unless you're there every other day, and, and the chances are that you, you'll over-fertilize with the nitrogen, which, you know, uh, is there, um, one could encourage more um, disease, you know, by the plants being wet and weakened. And two, um, it's, um, it, it kills your plant life. It doesn't encourage plant life, and that's why these other things, building up your soil, making it alive, um, encouraging these relationships underground. Um, in the end, you'll have a much better product and you'll be a lot happier and you'll see things that, you know, happen that you wouldn't if you use this sort of chemical warfare. Anyway. Do people do like vermicompost here? Do, like do you, in California, it's warm enough we can have worm boxes. But here, since they're above ground, all of them would die. So it's like in Alaska, they put them in the garage. I've heard that people do that. It's they, not enough. They take yeah. their worms out of the ground and put them in the garage. <laughs> the heated garage, I think, to keep them. Otherwise, they die up there too. We don't have to do that here. <clears throat> the worms make it. But I mean, making compost from the worms. Like we had box, oh. of, and then we would put our our food scraps in there. And oh yeah. And then you can, you can make tea out of it, or yeah. you can just harvest it. But I, but in the winter they'll die. You know, they'll. You can't. Yeah, that won't happen. So I wonder. The worm if box. It, does anyone do that here? It doesn't sound like it. No, okay. but you could. I, 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 I'm assuming you could if you just maybe buried, um, buried the worms. You know, in the winter, give them like eight or ten inches, or you know, whatever of soil over them. Especially if they're from around here, they should make it. Yeah, well, there's actually a certain type of worm. They use color red wiggler. Oh. Yeah, and it is voracious, and oh. you can harvest the compost pretty fast. I think that you're going to find worms plentiful naturally here, and that might be different it's than not in California. They're harvesting the worms. Well, no, I, no, no. What I mean is, you, they are yeah. already doing, in effect, what you're looking for in the compost. They're they're busy at work in the soils here, whereas in California, it might be too dry. And then they might be too deep, you know, way down deep in order to stay alive, unless you make those homes for them. Well, it's um, it's a way of, of compost. Yeah, getting rid of speeding it up. Yeah. No, I get that. Um, I want I want you to try it and See, let me well, know. <laughs> no, seriously, try that and your your sheet your um, mulching techniques too. It'd be interesting to see. Yeah. With the cardboard and the paper and all that, or you know what you've tried, tried See here. See if it works here. Yeah. Anyway. <clears throat> now there's much more water here, so it's easier to control certain things there because right. of that. But then there's less water, so it's a lot more laborious and water consuming. So I'm right. curious to see how much watering of a vegetable garden you have to do, or if it just gets rained on. If it, I'm not sure. <clears throat> We don't know anymore. <laughs> yeah. Um, like I said before, you came in. Um, we've only had two hot and dry summers in the past 25 years, and one was in 1995, and the other was last year. The rest of them have been sort of rainy, temperate, on the cool side. Not you know, you don't get many 80 degree days. I I hate that. I want months <laughs> full of 80 degree days and 90 even. I love 90. But what kind of irrigation do people do? People use 
<clears throat> Usually you haven't needed irrigation here. You don't here. need it. No. That, that's foreign to me. <laughs> we have typically a 90 day, perfect 90 day growing season. Where you don't have to augment water? Yeah. Really? Yes. Oh, that's a dream. <laughs> um, yes. And 20 years ago, I decided to see if, you know, if, if that was true. And, and I stopped watering. I actually had a whole, in that, in that garden there on those pictures, I had buried soaker hose all the way down those raised beds, zigzagged all the way, through, all the way down to the end, was practically down to the, the, the water. And, and it worked, it, it really worked well. But one, in the season where we, where it was really dry, the well <laughs> ran out when I watered everything. So I had to just decide not to do that again. And, and I just mulched deeply and waited for the rain. And it's been sufficient. It's, I've never lost plants or had plants that have suffered because I haven't watered. Uh, for vegetables too? Yeah. Wow. Put a deep mulch on. I like to use grass clippings and leaves. And, mm -hmm. and then just compost. By the end of the summer, it's all broken down. Um, I put, yesterday, I harvested rhubarb and I put the rhubarb leaves down. <laughs> to cover the weeds that were coming up so much. I like to do natural. Oh, no, that's great. That's Ruth have. Stout. Have you read Ruth Stout? Check her out. Um, okay. she's, she's a wise old uh, garden lady that has, is sort of experiencing a comeback right now. Uh, I wrote her down for a week. <laughs> uh, anyway. So. <laughs> cool. Yeah, cool. thanks for your time. It's fun to chat with you. Yeah. Can, well, can I ask, do you paint poppies? I do paint poppies. Are those your poppies on the poppy paintings on the wall of the nope. gallery down there? Nope. What, what gallery? Uh, behind the bookstore. Oh, I've seen those. On the no, outside. those aren't mine. Not yours. But you can see mine if you want. I mean, I'm working on one. Um, Where's your gallery? It's number one, Winooski Street. Uh, we just, do you know where we do it, it, it's, as the crow flies, it's 200 feet. <laughs> uh, Winooski Street is a side street. Um, mm -hmm. It's, it's like the second right after you come out of the library drive. There's a drive for the building next door, and then there's Winooski Street, and I'm in this blue building on the right. It's like the first building. <clears throat> but I'm doing a series of poppies right now. Because uh, I couldn't grow any, <laughs> so I'm going to paint them. <laughs> and I write about them. Uh, you might be able to access um, from the Valley Reporter. Yeah. I read a, I wrote a really excellent article <laughs> on uh, on poppies, poppies and tuberoses. Oh, blue poppies and tuberoses. That's the name of it. I think it was last year, um, maybe in March. But I name all the Latin names of all the poppies that you can grow here right. um, in spite of what people say and, and I tell you the different needs of each one and excuse me um, yeah that's all you need there's a, there's a lot of them big family and I do like painting them How about, I, I've been curious I never was able to grow it Hungarian bread poppy it's blue do you know this one? Uh, it's supposed to be big and Blue. I know a lot of blue poppies. They're not Hungarian. They're usually from Tibet or from well, I, that part that of the world. That might just be someone's common name from a catalog. Um, yeah, a lot. Of, I like growing those blue. Uh, I got hooked on those a long. I mean, wanting to grow. I, I read about in horticulture. That's another place you know to learn a lot is to read uh, horticulture. I don't know what it's like now. Actually, I stopped reading a few years ago because I thought they kind of dumbed it down too much. Um, used bookstores have super collection of books, you know, because people don't read them anymore, but gardening books, especially from like the 30s, that was a real super time. 40s, 50s, early 60s was, you know, chemical fertilizers, chemical this, chemical that. It was prosperity, the new age, post-war, you know, everything's bigger and better than everything we used to know. Uh, just dump it on, ching, 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 all the way to the bank, you know. But, um, <clears throat> books, especially from the 30s, uh, a lot of the Brits, uh, are really super worth having, you know, in a collection. Um, and just, you know, 
general primers, <laughs> things that you can find. Um, Rodeo, all Rodeo books. Um, there's one, Beth Chato, C-H-A-T-T-O. It's very technical. All the names are in Latin. There aren't a lot of pictures, but it's called, she's got two that um, are, I find indispensable. The wet garden and the dry garden. <laughs> And uh, in the wet garden, I'd love lists. If I if I write a garden book, it's all gonna be just lists, you know, lists and lists and lists of 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 uh, plants, you know, that are, are suitable for certain conditions. And hers is really great because she has a whole a uh, couple of pages on on wet plant of uh, plants that like uh, wet circumstances and full sun, which is totally crazy. <laughs> it's very <laughs> natural, you know. <laughs> But but there are and uh, and a lot of people around here need those names you know because the fields are so wet and um, yes um, I'm not familiar with um, anything else that's uh, easier like I know there's one called the Waterwise Garden it's by uh, Springer which is Laurel Laurel Springer and she's in California and um, she's put together one that Burpee published American series uh, that's super waterwise gardens and it tells you there again all these lists part shade part sun really dry totally dry maybe not so dry you know all the lists there that tell you what you can try uh. <laughs> can I ask if anyone here has tried um, using row cover or if you just do your vegetables you mean wow. plastic row cover? Plastic or the uh, hoops? You know, it's like woven. Like if that, that helps um, one for insects and the other is for extending, planting out earlier. Right. Or if that's, I was thinking of using it for um, planting out earlier or extending. Like what? Like for tomatoes. Like we would have planted our tomatoes on yeah, and so I get nervous. I'm right, nervous. right. I'm not going to get any. Um, no. So I'm just curious because I like to plant from seed. And I get bigger. tomatoes. Well, I trans. I started them already, but um, rather than buying starts, and so I can. I don't have a setup. My house has less light than this, so I'm curious how if anyone does. You know, plant thing under a row cover. Or to extend the season, be able to plant earlier outside. Yeah. Um, or is that what you're talking about, trying to go against what's going on No, here? not necessarily. I mean, to me, I, I I find it kind of laborious, you know, to move all those things out, and you're going to take them in, and in the end, it doesn't really accomplish that much. Um, if I was, uh, if my whole, my livelihood was at stake, I probably would, because if, if you can make, get something to the market a week ahead of time, you know, you, you um, yeah, I think it is to your advantage to, to explore all those things. Um, what I've kind of find, found out, it, 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 especially at the other end, and you miss this, um, is that the disease factor, the diseases underground and above ground take over, even if you've got that row cover, especially on tomatoes, and they, they will show later on. You won't even know that it's happening now. Mm -hmm. And um, it, there's fungus underneath the ground. So they just have a certain lifespan and it's well, if you want to extend the season here, even if the weather is, has self-extended because of the climate change, and it, to be sure, you, 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 we don't get a frost. Uh, it's a month later than it used to be, typically. Sometimes two months later. Um, and that's what's crippled the, the foliage colors. We don't get those freezing temperatures when they have to have been, and we don't get the colors, the vivid colors anymore, because the frost was what really determined uh, the, the, the brilliancy. Um, even though that, you, you're not getting those freezes in the fall and you think, wow, I can have tomatoes until November. You can't because the diseases have taken over and they take over all of nature. And you see all around you, everything's dying from disease because um, it's sort of a natural way of getting all the leaves off. So if we have this freak ice storm, the leaves right. don't all die and freeze and break and, you know, it's actually a natural part of the process for the disease to come late in the season and kind of take care of everything. So um, if you want to extend your season at the other end for your tomatoes, 
You have to you have to protect them against disease now, the minute you put them in, every three, four, five days. In this kind of weather, if it gets sunny, you might be able to extend your spray program um, for a week to 10 days, you know, every week to 10 days. But especially the elemental copper, and put a drench. Drench the ground when you plant them, all of it. You know, just drench it, because that'll kill what's there. Mm -hmm. And then you might want to do that every week to 10 days. Okay. Um, and then, do you have to do your plants too, with either the, with both? I rotate with both. You know, one week or every five days, I'll do the copper, and the next time I'll do the um, the neem. Because I've never successfully determined whether or not if I put them together and blend them, if they work, um, if they work as well. I haven't explored that. So, yeah. Andy, anything? I'm losing your interest here. <laughs> uh, I gotta use the, it's two hours, right? It is. Yes. <laughs> Nobody's paid for anything. It's like, <laughs> um, anyway, anything else? <laughs> Thanks for sharing all this information. Hey, I'm impressed. There's nothing I'd rather do. <laughs> I'd love to see you know people get excited about growing things and knowing what they're doing and having the, the wherewithal to find out more answers and to research and look up what they need. Uh, that's been provided for a lot of people like me who've left, you know, books <laughs> and uh, written ideas. That's a question. How do you prefer to trellis tomatoes? Oh, that's a good question. Save the best for last. Um, well, there's two types of tomatoes, determinate or indeterminate varieties. Okay, they break, they all break down into this. Um, determinate varieties set everything at once. You know, in a very short period of time, and that's it. That's their crop. So they, they make it to a certain point. They you know develop, and, and and the maximum potential. Set all the tomatoes. Boom. Indeterminates start setting, maybe earlier than I don't know earlier than the determinants, but they just keep going. It's not all at once. So given what we've just learned this morning, what would make sense for tomatoes here in Vermont? Would you have? I don't. Uh, you I wouldn't know, right? I mean, well. I'd be inclined to say indeterminate and, and hope that the plant is, is there when the weather is cooperative. Oh, yeah. No? Actually, I mean, I, 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 I'm leaning now. I mean, I, I think determinate ones are actually better because we have such a short period of time when we can get them. Like I've said, if you do this optimal spray program, I mean, this is organically approved, uh, Johnny's and the whole crowd, everybody, if you do this, um, <clears throat> you know, you, you, you can guarantee against certain things. But if you don't, there's probably a week at best when your tomatoes will be amazing. And after that week, they'll be horrible. They'll just taste horrible. And what it is, is that it's that fungus that I've told you about that's in the ground. It's there now when you plant them. And, and it's infecting your plants now. And it's systemic. And it works its way all the way up the plants. But you won't be able to tell that it's there until you're trying to harvest those tomatoes. Mm -hmm. And you'll have a few good ones for a week. And they'll be amazing. And then all of a sudden, the flavor's gone. The texture's different. The color's different. They don't, that disease has infected the tomatoes and you're done. Mm -hmm. So, which plant, a determinant or indeterminate, would, would give you the best results, given that situation? Sounds like determinant. You're a smart man. <laughs> <laughs> you had to hit me over the head. <laughs> <laughs> it was fun, though. <laughs> so, yes, I think he's right. Um, he's right. You know, if you're somebody that really manages your, your you know, knows how to do this, and, 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 and you do apply what I've told you, um, you could feasibly start getting tomatoes in July, early July, or no, I'm sorry, late July, and you could have them till early September, and the quality won't change if we get some sun. <laughs> <laughs> um, so. And if, 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 you're, if you're driven by guilt, and I'm driven by guilt. You are? 
if, if, if you get one solid tomato crop, you can pick it all and go in the kitchen and can it all, <laughs> right? But, but, right? But if it just keeps coming, sooner or later I get bored with the canning and then I feel guilty about the, <laughs> the tomatoes that are right. rotting on the vine. Right. So go to Termina. Yeah. Uh, knowing what you know now, it makes <laughs> sense, doesn't it? Because you'll have, and they'll be in peak, they'll be peak, you know, yeah. flavor, everything you want, that one batch, and then after that, you know, I, I have three plants. I have two that are determinate, indeterminate, I mean, right here, and one that's determinate. I've always planted big beef. I just love big beef. It's my favorite. It has been my favorite. Um, I find that it matures just as early as a lot of the other early maturing ones. Um, here's a couple. I'll give you some tomato. I'll, I should show off my tomatoes before I tell you all my secrets. But um, <clears throat> put the whole plant below the ground up until the top, like two sets of leaves. Um, what I do is I bury it in a sort of, a, not a shallow grave, but almost like four to six inches down. You put the ball, you know, root ball with a pot, and we'll sort of gently bend it up, and then have your plant stake right here. You know, fertilize, lime it. The tomato plant can grow roots on the entire length of its plant, mm -hmm. and will. And it, like you said before, it, it could layer itself. Uh, if, if it's in the ground, if you put a a stem down in the ground, you'll look, it'll have all these little wart looking things on it and pretty soon those will be roots. So if you place your whole plant, don't leave it sticking up over the ground hoping it's going to fill out, put it below the ground, that entire stem will become roots and before you know it you'll have a stem like this on your, on your main plant. Mm -hmm. What I've always liked to do is um, keep four or five main shoots and I take the, I've taken the suckers out so that I don't have 20 stems uh, to a plant, to answer your question about a half an hour ago. And um, yeah, I, I, I tie, I tie them to an eight foot stake and put it in two feet deep. And uh, I've done that for a long time. They grow six feet or more, so six or seven feet. <clears throat> um, this one, I had a picture. Me and my husband experimented with making a frame out of wood, like of stakes, like you're talking about. Uh -huh. But then, and then a cross would have a stake, and then the plant itself, he would wind up a string. If you have to have the right kind of string, or it would uh, deteriorate before the season was over. It's interesting. He it seemed worked. he seemed to like doing it. He's done it for a few years. Oh, this is off. I can't find. I can't isolate this picture at this minute. Anyway, here's what you'll get for tomatoes. You'll pick all those in one time. <laughs> oh, and here's, and then the sweet William I was telling you about under the cliff. Yeah. One and a half hours of sunlight a day. You know, the catalogs all say it needs full sun all day, especially in the north. Um, that isn't true. And I found that out. So get ready to find things out like that. And, um... Write it down. That's I'd be rich and famous if I'd written everything I know down. Seriously, and I, I knew that, and I didn't. I still didn't do it, because I think so much of the time, it, you know, wow. I, I like the spontaneity of how things happen. And, and well, over time. So, Mimi, it is time. And yeah. the library is closed now. So. Oh, it is. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. That's all right. Let's go. And thank you all for coming. Thank you, Mimi, for this wonderful presentation. It was fun. Yeah. Thank you, Jerome, for coming and filming. Yeah, yeah. <laughs>